This morning's scripture is found in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16 on page number 846 on the Bibles on your chairs. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and his disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for such belongs to the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands out on them. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Alicia. Didn't she do a good job? Well, hey, let me add to what's already been said, but happy Father's Day. If you're a dad, do me a favor and stand. I'll stand with you, and uh, let's recognize our fathers in this place. We appreciate you guys and all that you do. And today, of course, we have our Father's Day barbecue right around the corner. It's after our, uh, our second service, and so if you want to go over there, uh, somewhere around 12, 15, 12, 30, people will start to gather. We'd love for you to come. Um, you don't have to be a father to come. You can just be somebody that goes Foothill Church or invite some friends. We'd, anybody that wants to come is welcome uh, to be there. Uh, let me just say real quickly, I, I, I spoke about divorce and remarriage last week, and uh, from all the reports I hear, it really struck a chord with several uh, families and people, and, and I, I only tell you that just to say that, that we're going to be doing a series on marriage. We've been planning to do this for a while, but we're going to do a series on marriage beginning the last week of July and going through August. And so I just want you to be aware of that. It's not, for, it's not about parenting, it's about marriage. And, and so um, it's going to be a great series where we're going to talk in very relevant ways about how you can have the marriage that God wants you to have. And so plan on coming. But more than that, I tell you that now because that's something that you as people who come to Foothill Church should begin to help getting the, the word out. This is a great opportunity for you to invite friends and family. Uh, those of you who are single and not yet married, don't skip out on this because we're going to be talking about what you ought to be. Uh, searching for and what, what you ought to be looking for when it comes to your marriage. And so uh, we hope this will be something that is, uh, is helpful to, to everyone, uh, no matter where you are uh, in, in your life. So, so just be aware of that. Starting the last weekend uh, in July, we'll, we'll start that. Well, today we come to Mark chapter 10, uh, verse 13. And um, as I thought about this, I thought, you know, we, we as an American culture have a very schizophrenic relationship with children, don't we? Uh, on the one hand, we, have, we probably live in the most child-centered culture in the history of the world, and at the same time, the most child-averse culture in the history of the world. Uh, children are to us angels who can do no wrong or demons. Uh, they're the sun around which our universe revolves or the dark side of the moon. They are, some act as though they would cease to exist if they didn't have them, and others, they would cease to exist if they did. Um, at one extreme is what, uh, I don't know if you saw the, the, or heard about the, the graduation speech that was given by David McCullough at Wellesley High School uh, just a couple of weeks ago, but he, he ridiculed sort of the one extreme of how children are viewed in our culture. And he's talking to the graduates and he says this to them. He says, you've been pampered, cosseted, doted upon, helmeted, bubble wrapped. Yes, capable adults with other things to do have held you, kissed you, fed you, wiped your mouth, wiped your bottom, trained you, taught you, tutored you, coached you, listened to you, counseled you, encouraged you, cajoled you, and encouraged you again. You've been nudged, cajoled, wheedled, and implored. You've been fed and fawned over and called sweetie pie. We've been to your games, your plays, your recitals, your science fairs. Smiles ignite when you walk into a room and hundreds gasp with delight at your every tweet. We worship children, right? Or maybe we could point to the May 21st, 2012 issue of Time magazine. I don't know if you saw this, but they did a story highlighting what's called attachment parenting. And they started the whole thing off by telling us a story of Joanne Beauregard, a real woman, that's her name. And this is what it says. Quote, Joanne Be Beauregard is nothing so much as she is a mother, while when she finally got pregnant, she sat on the couch in her Denver area living room, nursing her infant from sun up to sun down. She nursed much of the night as well, since the baby slept in bed with Beauregard and her husband Daniel, a software engineer. 
When Beauregard got pregnant with her second child, she continued breastfeeding her daughter. The second baby, born March 2nd, now breastfeeds alongside his big sister, who's nearly two. Ooh. Uh, Joanne, Daniel, jo- Joanne and Daniel ended much of their social life when they became parents. There are no date nights. Joanne doesn't get away for afternoons to have lunch with her girlfriends. In fact, the only time Joanne has ever left either of her children in anyone else's care was when she was in labor with her second child. The article goes on to outline what attachment parenting is, and it sort of gives us the three basic tenets of attachment parenting. It says this. Number one, breastfeeding, sometimes into toddlerhood. Co-sleeping, that is inviting babies into the parental bed or pulling a bassinet alongside of it. And baby wearing, in which infants are literally attached to their mothers via slings. Attachment parenting dogma, they go on to say, also says that every baby's whimper is a plea for help and that no infant should ever be left to cry. So, so we've got this culture, right? And politicians this year are going to use children. They're going to raise children. They're going to say, you know, let's do this for the kids. Let's for our children, right? We've got this very child-centered culture. And yet, while this is happening, we are living in the midst of perhaps the greatest holocaust in human history. In the four decades since the landmark decision of Roe v. Wade, which legalized uh, abortion on demand, nearly 60 million human beings have been killed by abortion in America. That's more than the Nazi Holocaust, uh, Stalin's purges, Pol Pot's killing fields, the Rwandan genocides combined. One in six Americans have been killed by abortion. One in four African Americans have been killed by abortion. Abortion is the leading cause of unnatural death in the U.S. So who does it? One percent, one percent of all abortions performed are because of rape or incest. 6% are because of potential health risks. 93% of all abortions, this, by the way, comes from the Guttmacher Institute, which is not a pro-life institute. (laughs) 93% of all abortions occur for social reasons. That is, the child is unwanted or the child is just plain inconvenient. You see what I mean? In our culture, children are either idols, little gods that we worship that can do no wrong, or they're demons, they're diseases that we want to avoid. And how different this is from the Bible. The Bible doesn't worship children. The Bible doesn't demonize children. The Bible calls children a heritage. It calls them a blessing. It says they're a gift from God. And when we come to Mark chapter 10, we get a little glimpse that tells us Jesus loves children. He loves them. He doesn't worship them. He doesn't revile them. And rather, what you're going to see today, what Mark does, what Jesus does, is he explains to us why God gave us children and and what we're supposed to learn from them. And I think you'll find this amazing, okay? So here's what Jesus does. He basically gives us in this two principles. Okay, he's going to give us a principle, and then he's going to tell us why. Okay, now if you're new today, we just are Mark, walking through Mark. I didn't pick this because it's Father's Day. In God's grace, it came on this day. We've, we're, we're just kind of methodically walking through this. We'll take a break when we get to the marriage series. But we come to chapter 13, 10, verse 13 to 16, and we get to children. And in that, we're going to get two principles, and then Jesus is going to give us the why behind each principle. And you'll see how he does this, okay? So so let's let's talk about each one of these. The the first principle is simply this. Do something for children. Help them. Don't hinder them. Okay, now, now let's start reading together. Look at verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. Now stop there. Okay, Just get the picture in your head. Okay, so here's Jesus. He's teaching 
We know he's been doing a lot of teaching, you know, lately on, on various things, kind of helping his disciples see some things and, and uh, uh, understanding. Like last week, he, ta- he taught us about divorce and remarriage and those kinds of things. But now here he is. He's sitting, and people are coming to him. And he's a, he's a, everybody recognizes this is a great man of God. Whether or not they recognize him as the Messiah, at least they recognize him as a great man of God. And like what happens today, a lot of times people will come and say, can you pray for my child? They'll take him to a, a rabbi or they'll take him, you know, to the pope, bless my child, whatever. They, they want that special touch from a man of God. So the parents are coming. They're saying, will you come? Will you pray for my kid? Will you touch him? And they're coming, and just when they're about to get there, you know, the disciples apparently have like those yellow security bouncer shirts on, and they're like, no. You know, the man is back here. Leave him alone. He's too important for those snot-nosed kids like yours. And Mark tells us that the disciples, and he uses this word, he says they rebuked them. Now, this is no small word in the book of Mark. We've seen this word, same word, Jesus rebuked demons. Jesus rebuked the storm in Mark chapter 4. Peter tried to rebuke Jesus in Mark chapter 8 and got a rebuke by Jesus. I mean, this is a harsh, hostile, angry word, and the disciples are using it on children and their parents. All they want to do is come to Jesus. And that's because in that day, children were not esteemed at all. I thought they were thrown away. I mean, that that did happen in in some of the pagan cultures. But among the the Jewish people, they they were simply thought of as, man, you're you're the lowest member of the social ladder. You have no place. You have no power. You have no clout. You have nothing. And surely Jesus had more important things to do, more important people to see, than to be bothered by these low-caste, snot-nosed children. Now you see what's happening here. If we go back, in fact, To Mark chapter 9, and you start in verse 33, you get this whole lesson about who's the greatest. I mean, this is the disciples fighting among one another. Okay, I'm great. I'm better than you. I mean, this is just a weird conversation. I've never had this conversation. Like, I'm better than you. (laughs) But so they have this conversation, and Jesus is like, guys, no, no, no. The least is the best. You know, the the, the one who's servant of all is, 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 is the greatest. So then the next, the next little section we get to is where John comes and says, okay, Jesus, I, I basically get that I'm not better than Peter, but surely we're your disciples. We're this inner crew, so we're better than others. And Jesus goes, no, you got it wrong again. See, you guys want to tighten down this thing. Then you come to this week, and it's like, okay, all right, all right, I get it. I'm not more important to P- than Peter, and I get it that if people are out there doing great things for God, they should be included as one of your, you know, people that you look to. But, but Jesus, surely these low, insignificant people, you've got better things to do. The kingdom of God is not for this. And Jesus says, you guys have it all wrong. You keep wanting to tighten the circle, and I keep wanting to tell you, look, it's bigger than you think. Anybody who wants to come and be a part of this can come and be, even if they have no status. Okay? So, so now, how does Jesus react to this rebuke? Watch this. He sees it, verse 14, and he was indignant. Indignant. This is an gr- amazing word, Okay? Now, Mark doesn't talk about Jesus' emotion very much. He's not that he's not done it at all, but it is not common. It's more common in John or in Luke, other places. But we hear, for example, that Jesus got angry. Depending on how you read the passage, back in chapter 1, verse 41, the man comes to him and 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 he's sick, and Jesus is angry. He's not angry at the man. He's angry at what sin does to the body, what sin does to a person. We, we heard that, that Jesus got angry at the hardness of heart in the Pharisees. But, but here, Mark says, not, not he got angry. He says he got indignant. Now, this is the only time in, in Scripture, in the Gospels, that this, in the New Testament, that, that, that this emotion is ascribed to Jesus. There's no other time. And what that word means is not simply that Jesus 
felt something, which, which we hear him doing on occasion. But this was so much that he said something. He vented his displeasure. Okay, now usually when we read verse, uh, verse 14, you know, Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, it's amazing. We say it like this, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Right? Okay, no, he's indignant. Guys, stop it. Let them come. Are you kidding me? What are you doing? Don't hinder them. He's angry. <laughs> you know, you can tell a lot about a person by what makes them angry, can't you? What makes you angry? You know, bad score in golf, guys, a hard day at work, house isn't clean, you know, bad grades. What gets you angry? Jesus got angry when helpless, defenseless, powerless, vulnerable people were being mistreated. Does that make you angry? Jesus got angry when sin ravaged the human body. Jesus got angry when people who should know better hardened their heart to the truth. What makes you angry? You, you do know it's okay to get angry. Anger's never the problem. What's, what's, what's the, the problem with anger is, is what you get anger, angry about and then how you handle that anger. Because when Jesus got angry, he got angry at the right things. And what came out of his mouth, is this what you got to see? What comes out of Jesus' mouth when he gets angry, and the reason he didn't sin is because the motivation of his heart and the words that came out were words that were meant to minister, that were meant to serve, that were meant to pull people out. Were they hard words? Yes. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, the Bible says. Were they wounding words? Most likely. To tell somebody, get behind me, Satan, is not a nice thing to hear. Right? <laughs> but he said it. But, but they're words that were meant, come on, you, you can't think like this, you can't do this. See, see, let me ask you the question, is this your goal when you get it, like when, when, when somebody makes you angry, first of all, you got to ask yourself, what am I getting angry about? Second question is if you're thinking like you're, you're getting angry about the right things, husband to wives, wives to husbands, parents to children, whatever, is your goal to serve them, to minister to them, to pull them out of that, to awaken them to what's happening? Or is your goal to punish them, to humiliate them, to tear them down? A anger's not the problem. Okay, so he says to them, let the little children come. Don't hinder them. Now, you know what this means? This means guys... You should be making it easy, not hard, to come to me. Okay, don't throw up roadblocks. Tear them down. Guys, stop playing defense against children and play offensive line and block for them and clear out the way so that there's a lane to me. Rather than standing with arms folded and their security shirt on, they should have said, hey, everybody, stand back. We want these children to come to Jesus. So Jesus says, guys, rather than standing there like bouncers, rather than trying to draw the circle smaller and smaller, rather than playing defense, you need to help to let the children come to me. Rather than doing something to the children, you should do something for them. Clear it out. Permit them. Make it easy. You know, this is why at Foothill Church, we place such a high value on children's ministry. We don't worship our kids. We don't want to worship our kids. But we place a high value on it. And you know why? We, and we should. Because our job is to let the little children come. Our job is to clear the path, to make it easy, not hard. In fact, can I go so far as to say, to make it fun. 
to help you as parents by removing roadblocks so your kids want to come to church and don't want to leave. And I hear that report every week. My kid, you know, somebody just told me last night, my kid's like, can we go early? Can we, please, I want to get there. I don't, I don't want to go home. Praise God for that. And, and, and do you know why we, we think like that? Because I think that's what it was like for them to be with Jesus. I don't think he was like, okay, now kids, sit down. Let's get serious here. I got a lesson to teach you. I think Jesus laughed with them. I think he told them stories. I think he probably tickled them. I think he probably got on the ground with them. I think he was this guy that they said, we love being with Jesus. And it was meaningful and it was fun. That's what we're after. See, some people want a children's ministry that's all content and no fun. It's all information, no celebration, right? And what you get is you get kids who know Jesus about him but probably won't love him. I don't know what happened to my kid. I don't know what's wrong with my kids. I'm teaching them about Jesus. But are you any fun? Or it's like my dad pulls out eight, 85 concordances and we, you know, study the Greek together. Okay, look, I have no problem with that. But can you make it fun? Can it be like, this is great? And many times it's those kids who leave the church and go, no. I mean, some of you are coming back to the church after years of leaving because you look back on your childhood and say, it was religion. Then there's some that go, no, 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 we, we, give us all the fun, right? We want you juggling for our kids and balloons everywhere and You know, there's got to be things for them to climb on, whatever. I have no problem with that, but it's all fun. And your kids, you know, they get no content. It's all celebration, no information. And what you get is kids who who might say, I love church, but I don't necessarily love Jesus. I I love the event. I love the celebration, but I don't know anything about him. And we don't want those things to be in competition with your kids. We want to teach your kids the rich truths of Scripture in an atmosphere that is fun and engaging. We're not trying to compete with Disneyland, right? I think you can tell that just by walking into this place. That, that's not happening here. But listen, following Jesus isn't some dour religious exercise. Are you kidding me, Mom and Dad? Do I have to go back? See, see, one of the things that will hinder kids from coming to Jesus is a church that makes Jesus into just this fount of information. You know, all he does is he's kind of angry. You know, he, he's, he's not there with open arms. He's kind of there with folded arms. He's got a frown on his face. He's going to teach you about, you know, theology, sin, hell, the devil, and, and probably not a savior who knows your child by name, who laughs with them, who loves them, who cares for them, who answers their prayers. But it's Father's Day. So dads, let me ask you something. Are you making it easy or are you making it hard on your kids to come to Jesus? Like, do do you complain about having to go to church? Because you know you do, you're setting the spiritual. My, my wife and I talk about this like, look, if Chris, if you, if you want it, our, our kids will do it. They just follow your lead. Right? Do, do, you, do you complain about having to come to church or are you eager to get there? Do your kids see it? As the man who represents God to your children, what picture do they see? Is it one that makes them love him more or want to run from him? See, look, this is not just about 12 guys in Galilee 2,000 years ago. It's about your kids and Jesus. It's about you. It's about parenting. It's about the example that the men and women of this church set for our children. Jesus says we need to do something for our children and, and, and namely help them, block for them, get out in front of them. Don't hinder them from coming to Jesus. You know what, for some of you, that may mean simply getting involved in our children's ministry and saying, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna block for kids every week. It may mean coming and volunteering to make Foothill Church a better place for other people. It may mean you start to serve faithfully. You need to make it a priority so that kids and their families each week can come and it makes it easy 
all the time for them to come to Jesus, not difficult. If we're throwing up roadblocks, we want to know. Because God said we're supposed to let them come. Don't hinder them. For some of you, it means not putting up barriers in your homes that make coming to Jesus hard for your kids. You know, I think, I think some parents do this very actively. They resist, I will not go to church, out, but you wouldn't be here. But there's another group that's quite prevalent in today's culture that you don't, I mean, you wouldn't see it as preventing. But what you're doing is you're, you're distracting them from going anywhere but Jesus. Right, you, you, you let sports, you know, like, hey, my kid's a baseball player. He's eight years old. We'll see you in 16 years. Because, <laughs> you know, we're going to go through the system, and that's a Sunday deal. Okay, do, you do realize he has about a one in a billion chance of going to the majors, <laughs> about a one in a million chance of getting into Division I NCAA and getting any kind of scholarship. What are you doing? What are you doing to your child? Uh, are you kidding me? That you would let anything, anything, take precedence over them hearing the word of God. That you would do anything that would throw up a roadblock. Like, really, when the kid's 40, he's 45 like me? He's going to be trying to li relive the glory days and be on some stupid softball team? Give me, this is incredible to me, when I see parents that just go, you know what, I'll do everything else but take them to Jesus. You are hindering them, you're not helping them. What are you doing? It's not just sports, dance. I mean, it can be anything. And Jesus says, woe to you. Woe to you if you do that. Remember we talked about this two weeks ago? There's this real place called hell. You cause one of my little ones, not just children, but you know, anybody, but, but, but it does include children. You cause them to stumble, fall away from me. Woe to you. It'd be better that a millstone were thrown around your neck, that you died a horrific death by drowning than, than for you to, to face the wrath that's coming against you because of what you just did. See, now he tells us why. Let the little children come. Don't hinder them. Why? Look at that word. For. That's telling us why. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now, now let's, let's talk about this, okay? So there's the why. Don't hinder them because the kingdom will be populated by, by people like these children. Now, I'm going to deal with what this means in a minute when we get to verse 15. But now, just notice Jesus' logic. Just kind of follow this. The reason that you and I are supposed to help and not hinder is because to such as these belongs the kingdom of God. He did not say, he did not say, because to these belong the kingdom. He said, to such as these belong the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not populated by children. Yes, there will be children. It's populated by the kind of people these children represent. And so Jesus says, you shouldn't be blockading the very people that I came to reach in order to get to the kingdom. That is a sin no one wants to be responsible for. Woe to you. Disciples, don't you dare Ever do that again. Christian, never. Fathers, never. So Jesus starts off by saying the principle is this. Do something for children. Help them. Don't hinder them. Okay, what's the second thing he says, though? He says do something like children. Do something like them. Receive, don't reject. Look what he says in verse 15. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So there you go. 
Do something like children. Receive it. So when, now, when Jesus says, this is very interesting, by the way. When Jesus says, truly, I say to you. Okay, like, you'll see him say that every now and again in the Gospels. He's emphasizing the importance of what he has to say. Now, now look, that doesn't mean that Jesus is just sort of blah, blah, blah. And when he says, truly, I say to you, you should perk up, right? Everything he says is important. But when he says, truly, I say to you, he's saying, I'm about to blow your mind. I'm about to say something that's going to blow a category for you. Okay, this is different than something you've heard before. And that's what's happening here. See, look, he's saying, truly, I say to you, unless you receive it like a child, no one, no one in ancient literature talked about children like this. You, you will search in vain to find somebody that, that says that, that, I mean, that you should talk, that, that, that children are the example we should follow. This would have been totally shocking to his disciples, to the people that were hearing this, that in order to enter the kingdom, you had to receive it like a child. Now, what does that mean? Stop there, because this is huge. What does it mean to receive like a child? Because if we're not careful and we get this wrong, this is very interesting. If we get this wrong, then it will drive us toward religion and away from Jesus rather than driving us away from, from religion and toward Jesus. And here's what I mean by that. What does religion tell you? Religion basically is this. Religion says, because I do this, or because I'm this kind of person, you know, be, because I go to church, because I say a prayer, because I do these things, therefore, God accepts me. Right? That's religion. That is religion. That's exactly how it operates. Christianity says, because God loves me, and accepts me, therefore, I am this kind of person. I do these things. I don't do these things. That's radically, those are two totally different planets. One's religion, one's Christianity. Okay, now, now so what does that have to do with anything here? See, the danger is that you will hear Jesus say something that sounds so sweet and so tender and so wonderful, you'll miss the point. When, when we hear him say that in order to enter the kingdom, we need to receive it like a child, what do we do? We start thinking about, well, what's a child like? Oh, a child, you know what's great about child? They're sort of guileless. And this is where our, 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 our understanding of children or our culture will get us into trouble. We're going to be part, if we're part of that camp that believes that our children were born to this sinless perfection, they're so cute, they're so funny, they're so honest, they're so sincere, they're so innocent, they're so godless, they're so humble, whatever you want to say. Then we have to stop there and go, is that what Jesus is saying? So in order to receive the kingdom, in order to go to heaven in order to have a relationship with God and a relationship with Jesus I got to figure out how to become innocent and funny and cute and guileless and honest and all those things is that what it's saying because I'm not cute right <laughs> because if he's saying that that means that's what I've got to do I now I'm back into religion you see what I'm saying I'm back into religion and I don't get into the kingdom, and we rip the guts out of the gospel, and we use children to do it. And it sounds so cute and wonderful. But that's not what he says. He doesn't say, be like a child. He says, receive the kingdom like a child. Do something like children. Now, how does a child receive anything? Receive the kingdom, receive whatever. How do they receive? That's the question. What a child, look it, you gotta, you gotta come and let's, let's remember about children in this culture. Children had no rights, none. So they didn't come demanding. You, know, you gotta let me in, I got rights. You got nothing, you're a child. 
They had no clout. Right? They didn't receive the kingdom by leveraging their influence. You know, you don't know who I know and all this. You've got to let me in, Jesus. No, no, that's not how this works. you got no clout. You're a child. They had no claim to any possession. So you don't receive as a child by purchasing your way in. That's not how this works. You see, how, how do children receive things? How do my children? How do your children? Okay, let me tell you how it doesn't work at the Lewis home. Okay, Michelle spread, you know, she's an amazing cook. She makes this great meal, and I go sit at the head of the table, and, and, and there I am, and one by one, my, my children walk in and, and say, Oh, Pharaoh, king of the universe, um, <laughs> which I would love, by the way, but... Uh, They say to me, oh, daddy, the reason I should get to sit at your table tonight and eat your food and sleep under your roof is because I was a good girl, a good boy, and I earned my keep. Ah, well, then you can sit down, Gabby. Tucker, go ahead. Next, you're out. Right, what? No. That's not how it works for anybody, right? How does it work? Michelle spreads a table. When we sit down together, my children sit down. They eat with me. They sleep in my home. Why? Because they are my children. And I'm their daddy. And I love them. And no matter how much they've screwed up that day, they can eat my food. And yet, my children and your children are totally dependent upon me and you to do that for them, aren't they? Now, I'm not saying this never happens, but I'm guessing it probably doesn't happen in this room very often at all. I bet... Less than 1% of our children go to bed at night thinking, I wonder if I'll be able to sleep here tomorrow night. And I, and I wonder where my next meal's coming from. I wonder if I'll have breakfast. I wonder if I'll get lunch tomorrow. No. They just go, Dad's got it. He'll take care of it. I don't have to worry. Isn't that interesting about kids? They just don't worry. They just trust. See, see, that's what, what Jesus loves about children is not their inherent sweetness, humility, innocence, sinlessness. No, he knows full well, and I know and you know that your kids and my kids, those kids were all sinners just like us, right? I did, I, I did not teach my children to bite, And I walk into the bathroom one day, and one of my children has bites all over his back, which I guess leaves a girl that had to have done it, right? So anyways. (laughs) I can tell you right now, I, I never was sitting there, you know, watching TV with Michelle, and she took the remote control away from me, and I bit her. Right? They didn't learn that from me. They're sinners like the rest of us. Jesus isn't saying, this is what kids are. Kids are sinless. That's how we ought to be. No, he knows what they are. What he loves about children is that they come helpless, dependent, and yet totally full of trust. You'll accept us, Jesus. You'll play with us, Jesus. You'll provide for us, Jesus. And whatever they receive, your kids, my kids, these kids, they receive by grace. Not that they didn't earn it. So he says, look, that's what you need to be like. But he's also saying, listen, this is why God gave us kids. Now follow me here. Have you ever thought about this? Why did God give us children? Last week we said that we, there's a reason for marriage. Yep, 
Marriage is about companionship. Marriage is a beautiful thing. Marriage brings a, a man and woman together, and that's wonderful. But there is an ultimate reason that is on top of all of those other reasons. That ultimate reason is that the Bible says marriage is to be a reflection of Christ and his church. That love, that, that sacrificial, submitting love when they come together and they love each other. And we're so my marriage to Michelle, your marriage is, is supposed to be some small dim reflection of this ultimate reality. And people look and go, I see Jesus somewhere in there. Do you ever think there might be an ultimate reason for children? Okay, think about this. <laughs> right? God didn't have to do the whole procreation thing the way he did it, right? Okay, he could have just gone, look, he's God. We all agree he's God. He can do anything the way he wants to. He could have just said, you know, I'll just make the human race like earthworms. I'll split the dad in half and he'll become two people. Could have done that, right? That's not him. That's, that, that's God. He could have said, no, I'll just bring, when they have a child, that child will come into the world fully formed and developed, hopefully not like Will Ferrell's skit, but you know what I mean? Just come out and there you are. He didn't do that. What did he do? Man and woman come together, a child is born, and that baby, unlike any other animal, takes years to get to adulthood. Not days. He's not been running with an hours. He's a sandbag with a head. He <laughs> flops around. He's got nothing. He poops, he pees, he eats, he sleeps. That's your child for about nine years. No, kidding. Um, <laughs> he doesn't do it that way. God, God says, I'm going I'm I'm to give you a little baby. Now, why did God do that? Why did God give us children? Jesus tells us. Because the answer to this question gives us the ultimate significance of your children and my children, of any child. Children stand for something. Children point to something bigger than themselves. In children, what we're all supposed to see, it's this living illustration of dependence, of helplessness, of need, of insufficiency, of faith, and yet on the same time, provision and unconditional love. And I'm going to give it to you even though you can give nothing back to me. I'm going to do all that because you're mine. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the ultimate significance of children. And through that, we're supposed to see what it looks like for all of us to enter into the kingdom of, uh, of God. What does the Bible call us? We are called, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, the Bible calls you a child of God. So Jesus gets angry. And you know why he's so angry? I don't think he's just like, I don't like people picking on, you know, those smaller than them. I mean, maybe that's part of it. He's angry because the disciples are disrupting the very picture of salvation that he wants everyone to see. They are making a mockery of the gospel by saying, no, no, no. The only people who can come to Jesus are people who are spiritually mature. The only people who can come to Jesus are people who are important, who are in the inner circle. And, and so Jesus goes, you guys are dead wrong. And he picks up these kids and he puts them in his lap and he lays his hands on them and he prays for them and he blesses them. Right? They came just to be touched. Jesus goes, I'll take that and I'll bless them. See, if you come to Jesus like this, he'll do the same for you. You don't need clout, right? You don't need power. You don't need a pedigree. You don't even need maturity, spiritual or otherwise. You just come. You say, Jesus, save me. I have nothing. I don't, I don't offer you anything. And it says he'll take you and he'll receive you. See, are you, are you willing to come to Jesus like that? If you are, then the kingdom belongs to such as you. But if you're not, then Jesus says, 
you'll never enter the kingdom. Come to Jesus. Run to him. You don't have to offer him one dime, and he'll take you just like you are. Let's pray.